Dr. Brunel is a professor and international renowned expert in obesity, and uh, he's also director of the Root Center for Food Policy on Obesity at Yale. He is uh, very close to the work we do here in the organization, and particularly in the area because he works in uh, public policies regarding nutrition and, uh, and food policies in the countries, and the particular uh, targeting the obesity and particularly targeting all the, the actions that has, can be taken on uh, obesity and children, which you know is now a big issue in the Americas, in particular here in the U.S., is, a, is one of the priorities of the government. He will uh, talk to us about the activities uh, he's doing in the, in the center, but also and particularly on the experiences, uh, existing experience on self-regulation of the, the food industry, which is today a very important topic when you're looking for the control of the NCDs and the high-level meeting we have in New York. So it's all connected. Um, uh, uh, I'm sure everybody will enjoy it. I apologize for the little delay. We have this problem with the system, but I think now it's all set up and uh, we can start. Welcome. Thank you. It's a wonderful opportunity for me to be here at PAHO. Enrique Jacobi, who many of you know, invited me to come to do this talk. And He's been a friend and colleague and somebody we've done some research with, and I'll describe some of that today. So if Enrique is watching out there on the internet, I'd like to say hello to him and thank him for arranging this talk. The work that I'm going to discuss today is part of the Rudd Center, which is at Yale University. And I've circled our website down there on the bottom corner of the page uh, because it's a website rich with information on food policy and obesity-related issues. We have a variety of slide presentations that can be downloaded, uh, information, policy briefs, uh, and also a series of podcasts that we've recorded with visitors to the Rudd Center, excellent people who've worked in the food policy area. So today I'd like to talk about the way we might address the obesity problem, and I'll begin with a conceptual scheme that we've used in our own work. I'll talk about two particular issues of importance food marketing and the consumption of sugar-sweetened beverages. And then I'd like to get to the issue of food industry and self-regulation. The reason I believe that's an important topic is that the food industry is in all-out pursuit of your trust. They're asking you to trust them and therefore for government to let them do as they wish. And the food industry is saying government doesn't need to regulate us. In fact, if government does regulate us, it represents intrusion into personal freedoms, and it represents a nanny state, et cetera. But the industry is further saying that we're taking steps ourselves to change things, and that we can police ourselves enough so government doesn't have to be involved. So I'd like to discuss that issue and see whether, in fact, we believe that the food industry can be trusted in this context. I begin with this quote from Nelson Mandela, there can be no keener revelation of a society's soul than the way in which it treats its children. Our children are being treated in a deplorable way now with respect to their nutrition. Um, now, great strides have been made in correcting undernutrition around the world, but this problem uh, is being more than outdone by overnutrition problems in countries everywhere. And the fact is that there are these realities that we face as societies, certainly in the U.S. and increasingly in other countries, where we recognize that the future depends on our children, but they are being robbed of their future. Now, you probably all know that estimates in the United States are that the current generation of American children will be the first in the country's history to lead shorter lives than their parents did. And that's despite life-saving advances in medicine, but it's because of poor diet, physical inactivity, and other lifestyle factors that lead to diseases such as obesity and diabetes. And there are responsible players for this. The, the food environment, the physical activity environment has grown increasingly toxic. When people are exposed to this environment, they get sick. They get sick by becoming overweight and diabetic. They develop heart disease and cancer. And as this lifestyle, which began in the U.S., but is quickly spreading around the world, you see the diseases spreading with it. 
So certainly everybody would agree that obesity and overnutrition are global problems, but you can see from these data behind those orange boxes just how bad it is. So this slide shows incre expected increases in diabetes up until the year 2030 in the U.S. and China and India. So in the U.S. we're expecting a 37 percent increase in diabetes, which is very alarming because the rates are so high already. But in China and India the increases are expected to be this. And because of the enormous size of the populations in those countries, the world burden of diabetes will grow tremendously in upcoming years in a relatively short period of time. And you really could show these graphs for any country in the world and, and see numbers like this. So it's really pretty alarming. If you collapse data across all developed and developing countries, here are the expected increases in diabetes, where the, the greatest increases are expected in developing countries. One would have never thought you would find the day when overnutrition would become a more significant problem than undernutrition in countries like India and China. So the question is, what's gone so horribly wrong? What's, what's so badly broken? And is there the courage to change it? And I use the word courage here very intentionally because my own belief is that we are not going to solve these problems, especially obesity, by simply doing more of what we're doing already. What we've done already has been a complete and utter failure, especially in the United States. And so there has to be courage to change things. There has to be courage to stand up to powerful corporate interests, to change the way government does business around food, and to think in completely different ways. And so we are trying to think of what those ways might be. And we begin with this conceptual scheme. In many places around the world, with the U.S. as a prime example, when there's, a, when there's disease that comes from choices people are making, how much they smoke, how much they drink, what they eat, whether they choose to exercise or not, etc., the focus is generally first placed on the individual. And so the society, our society, our society defaults to the idea of giving knowledge to people, giving them information or education, and then we try to implore them along the way. We try to motivate them to change. And our hope is that we, we then educate and we implore. Now in the case of a problem like obesity, you can also have medical interventions. You can medicate and you can operate, but the hope is you end up with less obesity. So this idea that you that it's an individually focused approach, that you apply new knowledge to the individual or you try to motivate the individual and that will get you to less obesity has been an experiment we've been doing now for decades and all the while prevalence has only gone in, in the wrong direction. So the statistics, statistics aren't very good with this model. And here's an example of education. So behind these orange boxes you're going to see a graph of the number of people in the U.S. who get the recommended levels of physical activity every day. And this is from 1986 to the year 2000. Now during that time, a great deal became more became known about physical activity. There was a Surgeon General's report on physical activity, exercise devices everywhere, health clubs people join. There really can't be many people in the United States who don't know that they should be physically active. But let's look at the number of people who are over that period of time. It's a low number and it's a complete straight line. It's not a very good argument for information and education. It's something much different has to be done. Here are data on diet. Diets, these are the percentage of American adults who get, get the recommended number of fruit and vegetable servings every day. Certainly most people realize they should eat fruits and vegetables but the numbers look like this. What about diets in American children? Maybe we're doing better with our children, fruit and vegetable servings in children, and the numbers look like this. So these are not strong arguments for just doing education. So if we look at what we're doing right now, we're educating and imploring. This has been the main stance of the federal government in the United States, but it hasn't taken us very far. So the question is, can you wipe the slate clean and come up with a whole new conceptual scheme. And instead of focusing on the individual, focus on things that occur before the individual gets involved in the decision-making process. Now this is public health 101. This is fundamental public health. The concept is can you create conditions in the environment 
where the individual is more likely to make healthy than unhealthy decisions. And so you can change environmental circumstances to do this. You can change the economics, let's say, f of food. You can use legislation and you can use the regulatory authority of governments in order to create what the economists have called optimal defaults. So if I can leave you with just two words today, I hope it would be optimal defaults. So defaults refer to the conditions that people respond to in their environment that are just there automatically. And um, there are powerful defaults that affect human behavior. And right now, for food and physical activity, the defaults are really terrible. And that's why we have so much obesity. And if the defaults can be changed, then we feel that there's more opportunity to create change at the population level. So optimal defaults, we hope, might lead to less obesity. Now here's an example from economics of how powerful defaults are. In the United States, um, when people take, get a job, many employers offer the employees the opportunity to enroll in a pension plan. And a pension plan is a plan where the, the individual uh, money is subtracted from the individual's paycheck. It's put in a bank account. The, the employer matches the money. And that grows into a fund that the, that the individual then uses in their older years. So most people believe that individuals who enroll in the pension plan are doing a social good for both themselves and the government because then the government doesn't have to pay so much for them during their later years. But employers offer two approaches to pension plans. In one, one approach, you are not in the pension plan by default, but you can choose to become in the pension plan. The other employers do the reverse, where you are in the pension plan automatically when you get a job, but you have the choice of opting out of it. So the individual has the same choices in both sets of circumstances. You can either be in or out, but the default is different. And it makes a big difference in how many people enroll in pension plans. So if the default is not to be in the pension plan, you have to make the active choice of enrolling, you get about 50% of people doing it. But if you just change the default, you get about 100% of people enrolling. So you could try to educate or motivate people to get in the pension plan and hope you could go from 50 to 100%, but you probably never could, or you can just change the default. So again, that's Public Health 101, and here's a health-related example. Behind these boxes, you're going to see the percentage of people in European countries who agree to be organ donors. The countries to the left of that white line, Denmark, Netherlands, the UK, and Germany, use the US approach, where you're not an organ donor by default, but when you get your driver's license, you can opt in and you can become an organ donor. And you can imagine what's coming to the right of that line, countries that do the reverse, where you are an organ donor as the default, but you can opt out if you wish to. So again, the individuals have the same choices under both circumstances. But using the default that the US uses, here are the percentage of people who are an organ donors. And in the other countries, the numbers look like this. Now, th these are numbers that should make you catch your breath. These are, these are stunning, startling numbers. And if you had a trillion dollars, let's say, to do education, could you ever go from those left-hand numbers to those right-hand numbers? Or you can just create default circumstances. So one can automatically think about defaults in the food environment. For example, if you have schools that are selling unhealthy foods to children or have them available, then children will eat those foods. If you take them out of schools, children will eat a better diet. There's good research showing that to be the case. So just changing the default can get you pretty far down the road um, in sometimes ways that really don't cost any money. And one of the problems with education, and I'll come back to this later, is that you can never ever do enough education to compete with what the food industry is doing to educate people to eat an unhealthy diet. And I'll give you some numbers on that. So right now, in many countries, we have disastrous defaults. And these are just examples of things. But portion sizes have grown much larger over time. In some countries, the US, uh, as an example, uh, if you don't have much money, it's easier to buy a bad diet than to buy a good diet. Um, there's too little access to healthy food. There's way too much access to unhealthy food. And then food marketing would be another bad default. But again, these are just examples. There's a very long list of the kind of things that create bad defaults. 
So I'd like to give you some examples of those, and I'll start with the issue of food marketing. Um, any of you who watched the Baseball World Series in the United States last year would have seen this big Coca-Cola bottle, which is in the San Francisco Giants baseball stadium. But these advertising icons are everywhere, and if I think back to when I was a boy growing up in the United States, the Midwestern part of the United States, I was exposed to very little food marketing compared to what children are exposed to now. And this has a big impact on them. So if you could take the entire literature on food marketing, and there's a vast amount of it, major reports from the Institute of Medicine, reports from different countries around the world, and you could take all that science and distill it into three words, I think these three words would be a fair representation of what the marketing research shows, that it's powerful, it works, or else the industry wouldn't spend so many billions of dollars doing it. It's relentless, it really never stops. And it's happening in many ways that people don't understand and don't, don't know they're being marketed to. And then we believe that it's exploitative, that it does it intentionally goes around people's cognitive defenses against marketing, and it intentionally goes around the parents' ability to market it, to, to monitor it when it's directed at their children. And there are many examples of this. This is a remarkable example, baby bottles with soft drink company logos on them, uh, but there are many more that are just as egregious as this. Increasing portion sizes have been, become a real problem, and there's good research showing that the more people are served the more they consume. Now most people don't realize this is the case and if I asked you do you eat more if you're served more food you would say no because you believe you eat just what you need but research shows that you that's not what happens that if you're given more you consume more and as the unit gets larger whatever is in a bottle a bag or a box grows larger people over consume and so you could see an example like this from an American convenience store called 7-Eleven, and the, the drink on the far right, the double gulp, if you were to consume this with a sugared beverage, it would have 48 teaspoons of sugar. So the numbers are really pretty remarkable. <coughs> when I was a boy, the only type of food marketing that I was exposed to occurred on Saturday morning cartoon television, and there were advertisements for sugared cereals, but that was about it. That's traditional marketing, but now that's been joined by a whole new generation of marketing. And these terms, that to describe it, guerrilla marketing, viral marketing, stealth marketing, were not created by nutrition people who oppose marketing, but by the marketing people themselves to boast about how good they are at marketing to people when people don't realize that they're being targeted. And there are many examples of this, the guerrilla marketing. Um, some of you may have seen the popular American television show called American Idol. At one point, it's, it's a wildly popular show, and people of all ages watch it. And at one point, those Coca-Cola glasses showed up in front of the three judges for that show. I met one of those judges at an event who told me tens of millions of dollars exchange hands between the Coca-Cola company and the show just for having those glasses placed there. Why is it worth so much money to Coca-Cola? It's because people don't code this as advertising. They see this, it registers, it has, it has a, an impact on them when they don't realize that they're being affected. And this would especially be true of children. We've done a series of projects at, at, our, at the Rudd Center at Yale on food marketing directed by a colleague of mine, Jennifer Harris, and assisted by our deputy director, Marlene Schwartz. We've had, we have funding from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and the object was to document how much marketing was being directed at children for different categories of foods. The first year we looked at sugared cereals or cereal, breakfast cereals. The second year we looked at fast food and we're doing a third report this year. This is the cereal, cereal report that we released two years ago. Um, this report's available online and you can find it from our center if you'd like. <coughs> but essentially what we did, and this was a year's worth of very expensive research where we bought data from companies like Nielsen <coughs> and others to find out how much marketing was being done on, on television, how much marketing was being done on the internet, etc. And think of this, what we did was we created a list of uh, cereals that children, thank you very much, that children are being exposed to through marketing. And we rank order them according to nutrition. So think of a list 
with the worst nutrition cereals at the top. Those are the ones that would have the worst nutrition scores and the best ones at the bottom. And next to it, we put a list of the foods that are marketed most aggressively to children. And so it looks like this. If you take the best 12 cereals on nutrition score, here's what they are. And many of these are cereals you won't heard of, have heard much of because they're not marketed very much. And then we look to see how much advertising is being done on television through things called adver games where children go to websites of companies and play these very engaging games. And then how much marketing is done on youth websites like Disney and Nickelodeon. So if you put all these together, let's look and see how much marketing of these products is done to children. Exactly zero. So let's take the worst dozen cereals. So these are the ones with the worst nutrition scores. And let's see how much they're marketed to children. And it looks like this. So you wouldn't accuse the cereal companies of intentionally trying to create obese children. But they are in the business of maximizing consumption of their most palatable products because those are the ones that people overconsume. So if they were in the business of trying to maximize obesity, isn't this exactly what they would do? Take their cereals with the worst nutrition profile and market them most aggressively to children. So we followed this with a report a year later on fast foods. So we looked at fast food marketing of all sorts directed to children. And without going through too many of the details, here are some of the fundamental findings. The average preschool child in the United States sees more than 1,000 advertisements for fast food every year. Now, how can that not have an impact, especially when those are so engaging with icons like Ronald McDonald and engaging music and things like that? We looked at all combinations of children's meals at these restaurants. Each entree, like the chicken nuggets, put together with each possible combination of side dishes and drinks. Only 12 of 3,000 such combinations met the standards set out by the IOM, Institute of Medicine. African American children in the U.S. see 50% more ads for fast foods than white children do. Now that's partly because they watch more TV, but there's disproportionate advertising even beyond that. And while the companies say they're doing less marketing, the research that we found showed that they're doing more. So we will come back later and talk about industry promises to do less marketing, but when you see data like this, it doesn't suggest that the promises are being kept. So here's an example of how powerful of marketing is. RWJF stands for the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. And they are by far now the largest funder of work on childhood obesity. So they were an absolute godsend to this field. They're spending $100 million a year now on this problem. Let's find the day of the year by which the food industry has already spent $100 million just advertising unhealthy food to children. So this little dot is going to go around and around and it will land on January 4th. So people who talk about addressing obesity through education have to consider this, that this is what we're competing with. Now none of us, even if we were the whole federal government of a country as well to do as the United States, would not have a hundred million dollar budget. But if we did, by January 5th, the rest of the year belongs to the industry. So that's why we believe changing the default conditions are going to be a more powerful approach. Let's go from marketing to talk about sugar-sweetened beverages. In the U.S. and in other countries, the number of calories that people consume in liquids has gone steadily up over the years. And this has major implications for the way the body handles calories. And I'll come back to that in a minute. So sugared beverages used to be a small number of flagship products like Coke and Pepsi and 7-Up, but that they've been joined by whole new categories of sugared beverages like sweetened teas and things that are dressed up to look good when they're essentially sugar water with health-related claims or names. There are energy drinks, there are sports drinks, etc. I saw, I was in the supermarket the other day, and you may know that Gatorade, the sports drink, is now being marketed as having three versions. You're supposed to have not only one, but three versions. One to drink before 
you exercise, one during exercise and one after you exercise. And I, thought, I saw three kids standing there in the supermarket talking to each other and I stopped and listened to them. And they, they didn't, they, just looking at them, they didn't look like they were particularly athletic. And so nutritionists have estimated that you have to do the equivalent of a 100 mile bike ride before you start needing anything like this. And these kids were talking about the three versions and how you really need all three and things like that. And so it's very clever marketing. So again, this is what you have to compete with if you want to do health education. Why are beverages so special? Why should, they, why should we care more about them than pizza or fast food or any other category of food? Well, there's a very long list of why, why care about these things. First, in the American diet, at least, they're the single greatest source of added sugar. They're completely empty calories. Almost anything else, a Twinkie, a Cheeto, a potato chip, has at least some nutrition, but these beverages have none at all. Next, and, and I think most interesting, is the fact that the body doesn't seem to respond very well when it gets calories in liquid form. So there's pretty good research on this now, and it seems like the body just doesn't recognize calories very well when they come in liquids. So let's say we did an experiment with the people in this room, and we'll divide the room right in half, and let's say the people on this side of the room, you eat your normal lunch, whatever is normal lunch for you, but you, do, you get 200 calories extra than what you're accustomed to eating. But you get your 200 calories in solid food. It could be pizza, ice cream, or donuts for that matter. This side of the room, you eat your normal lunch, you also get 200 extra calories, but you get them in a sugared beverage. And then we follow you in subsequent meals to see if your body recognized that you had 200 extra calories and adjust its intake subsequently in order for your weight to remain stable. This side of the room will do better than this side of the room. And so the fact that people are drinking so many of these sugared beverages becomes a real problem. Next is there's really interesting recent research on the way sugar acts on the brain. There are animal studies and there are human brain imaging studies that suggest that sugar acts on the brain in a very similar way to traditional substances of abuse, such as morphine, alcohol, and nicotine. Now, nobody would argue that, that the strength of the effect is as strong as it is for those other addictive substances, but the addictions researchers are finding remarkable similarities. And the, the metaphor that gets used by the addiction researchers is that drugs of abuse hijack the brain and they take over people such that personal responsibility, will, and things like that get circumvented. And the question, does food have that same potential? So when our children, for example, are drinking so many sugared beverages, is it just because they taste good? Is it just because they're being marketed to them so heavily? Or is there something going on in the brain that makes people crave those things? There's the addition of a known addictive substance, caffeine, again, not strongly addictive, but addictive enough to create withdrawal symptoms when people don't get enough of it, uh, enough to create craving and maybe even tolerance, so this becomes an interesting issue. And then in my mind, there's rock solid science linking sugared beverage consumption to diseases like obesity and diabetes. That doesn't mean every study shows that, but if you find the studies that don't show a link, chances are they're going to be funded by the soft drink industry. The world's most valuable brand is Coca-Cola. In the United States, here's what's happened with milk and soft drink consumption from the 1970s forward. And you can see in the 1990s the lines crossed. The average American consumes 50 gallons a year of sugar sweetened beverages. And we have to remember that there are many people out there who don't consume any at all. So the average for the people who do can be very high. A nice paper got published by researchers at the National Institutes of Health who said that in children ages 2 to 18, very young children, 40% of their calories are empty calories, that is they have little or no nutrition, and that the largest contributor to this was the sugar sweetened beverages. There are a number of agencies around the world and in the U.S. that have called for reducing sugars through reduction in sugar sweetened beverage intake. <coughs> so there really aren't that many health organizations who aren't in favor of doing something like this. 
<clears throat> Centers for Disease Control have made reduction in sugar sweetened beverages a centerpiece of their uh, obesity prevention strategy. And there are cities and states all around the U.S. now that have very aggressive anti-soda consumption campaigns. New York, Boston, Cleveland, Philadelphia, the list goes on and on. So in 2009, I, I wrote a paper in the New England Journal of Medicine with Thomas Frieden, who at the time was the city health commissioner in New York, now is the head of the CDC in the U.S., <clears throat> making a public policy case for taxing sugar-sweetened beverages. Now, the idea had actually been around much longer than that. It goes back about 20 years. But in 2009, it got life. And one of the reasons it got life was that the economy was so bad around the world that states and localities and the federal government needed ways to raise money. And so a tax like this starts to make sense, really for two reasons. One is that you could raise a lot of revenue from a tax on sugar beverages, but also you could lower health care costs and therefore lower government cost. We followed that by a paper later, uh, also in the New England Journal of Medicine, making a public health and economic case for taxing sugar-sweetened beverages. In this case, one of my co-authors was uh, Thomas Farley, who's now the health commissioner of New York City. Um, prominent nutrition researchers Walter Willett, Barry Popkin, David Ludwig, and economist Frank Chalupka. It was a very interesting group of people to collaborate with. And what we called for was a penny per ounce tax on any beverage with added sugar. And the hope was that at least some of the revenues would get poured back into programs for obesity prevention. Estimates are that if you had this level of tax in the United States, that it would decrease consumption between 10 and 23 percent of these sugared beverages. And the government agency here um, suggested that that could reduce health care costs by $50 billion over 10 years and that it would generate $150 billion in revenue. And if that got used for health related programs, you could see quite a benefit from that. If you just look at a, I take, take a neighboring state here, Maryland, you can see how significant the revenues are for a tax. So in one year, the tax in, in Maryland of a penny per ounce would generate $244 million for that state. How worried is industry about this? Um, we've been um, uh, at odds with industry for years and years over a number of things that they do. Uh, but nowhere along the line have they responded as aggressively to any proposal that I've seen as they have for a sugared beverage tax. If you're a person who favors access, better access for unhealthy food, or to healthy food, the industry won't fight you. They'll even help you pay for it in some cases. Now think of what that means for a moment. There are two fundamental approaches toward changing the diet. One is to get more good foods into the system, and the other is to remove bad foods from the system. Now, the implicit but never articulated assumption is that if you push good foods into the system, bad foods will leave the other end. But that hasn't really been tested. And in fact, when you do test it, it tends not to, not to be proven very, very strongly. So it's possible that providing access to healthier foods it's an important thing to do for social justice reasons. It's a very important thing to, do, thing to do for health reasons other than obesity because, say, fruit and vegetable intake is related to all sorts of good health outcomes. But in terms of obesity, it could be that you're just adding calories on top of calories that exist already. Because just having fruits and vegetables doesn't make soda, pizza, ice cream, fast food any less desirable. That's one way to look at it. And the fact that industry doesn't care about that tells you something. Because if people were going to drink less sugared beverages or eat less fast food because you created food access, the industry would oppose it with everything they had. They do oppose sugared beverages in a big, big way. Here's the lobbying money that's spent by, in the United States, Coke, Pepsi, and their trade association, which is called the American Beverage Association, up until 2009. And you can see what happened that year as states and cities around the United States began seriously considering a sugared beverage tax. Here's the legislative map as of May of 2011. These are places that have seriously considered or discussed 
different taxes on sugar-sweetened beverages. If you add up all the states that have considered this since 2009, it's a larger list than even this. So the, the, this is spreading around the United States. Now, no large taxes have been passed yet. Small taxes exist, but too small to affect consumption. So thus far, industry has won the initial fights. But industry won all the initial fights with tobacco taxes as well. And then public health prevailed. Tobacco taxes are now high and are very much the norm in the United States. So we'll see what happens with sugar beverage taxes, but my own guess is that they'll go very much the way the tobacco taxes did and that the fact that the industry has won the first few rounds is completely to be expected. As the idea becomes more normative, um, public health officials get involved and government authorities come on board. Let's look at sugar to sweetened beverages in Latin America. A colleague of mine at the Rudd Center, Nicole Novak, is doing a project in uh, conjunction with Enrique Jacobi um, that got started he, when he was here and before he left for Peru where they're documenting the consumption and trends in sugar beverage consumption and looking at the tax possibilities in different Latin American countries. And so they've used data from these different, these sources uh, in addition to government reports, in addition to industry reports. And we believe that this, the numbers that we have available show relative consumption between countries but are a great underestimate of total consumption because all these these surveys capture is household consumption and of course many people are drinking lots of these beverages outside the home in schools in restaurants and just in their day-to-day -day life if you look at soft drink consumption by by country you can see the united states on the far left and that red line is the u.s number and you can see that countries like Peru, Colombia, Brazil, Chile, and Mexico have very high sugared beverage consumption, in some cases rivaling that of the U.S. or even, even exceeding it. And I'll show you data from two countries to look at trends. So these are data from Peru, 1997 to 2009. And if you look at beverage trends there, we're going to look at juice consumption, which is a black line at the bottom of the page. That didn't change very much. But the two lines at the top of the page are going to be milk consumption and consumption of sugared beverages. So in Peru, the trends look like this. The blue line at the top are the sugared beverages. SSB stands for sugar sweetened beverages. The milk is the red line. So you can see that these numbers in 1997 were pretty similar. And, and if you go back before that, you can imagine the milk consumption was much higher. But these are very um, dis discouraging trends to see in a country like Peru. In Mexico, let's see what the numbers look like. Milk consumption in 1985 started off much higher and those lines have crossed as well. So now Mexico has some of the highest consumption of sugared beverages in the world. And this, of course, can lead to some very unhappy outcomes in terms of health. If you look at revenue, how much can be generated by a tax that's about a penny per ounce on sugared beverages in these different countries, you can see that the numbers are, are really very high and very impressive. So the question is, would a tax like this make sense? Well, there are all, all kinds of political issues. And of course, politicians who propose doing something like this are going to invite the anger of the industry, which can be considerable. Uh, this is shown to be the case in Chile, for example, where some very courageous and very prominent legislators have been working on things like a sugared beverage tax. But again, the tobacco industry seemed formidable at one point, and now we have many public policies related to that. So government leaders, when they see these revenue numbers, can get pretty interested in a tax like this all of a sudden. And then if you can estimate, which is harder to do than just estimating revenue, how much uh, health care savings there would be, then it, the number looks even better. So let's go from these two specific examples of the food marketing and sugared beverage consumption and ask whether the industry can be trusted. Now, industry wants to be at every discussion. They want to have a person at the table. They want to have input into all policies. And the degree to which they actually do have input varies a lot around the world. And it varies a lot depending on what kind of government is in place in a country at a given time. So right now, the food industry has far less input in Washington 
than it did during the Republican administrations or even during the Clinton administration. And that's because the public trusts the food industry less than it used to. Now, it doesn't, it's not that it, as if it doesn't have any power at all. It still has considerable power. But the trend is changing. So industry is making all kinds of promises um, in hopes of gaining your trust. So there are promises about marketing. There's promises about getting sugared beverages out of schools. And then a lot of other things that have been self-regulatory pledges made by the industry. And the question is, is the industry living up to its promises? Well, it's, it's an empirical question. We can find out. If they say we're going to market less to children, then we can study whether they actually market less to children. Now, in the case of that particular question, it doesn't look like they have lived up to the promise. But one can put each of these things to a test. So it would be nice to be objective about it. We can give the industry the benefit of the doubt, but if they don't live up to their promises, then government can rain down on them regulation and legislation. In 2010, with two colleagues at Johns Hopkins, I wrote a paper in the American Journal of Public Health on food industry and self-regulation. And we looked to see whether food industry was behaving in a responsible way. And at that point, it didn't look like the industry had done much with its promises. Uh, but now we're, we're a couple years beyond the time we wrote this paper, and we can look to see what we know now. Here's an example of industry behavior. In the United States, you've probably seen this product, vitamin water, which is a product owned by Coca-Cola, and it's sugar water with some vitamins thrown in. And the question is, is this a healthy thing for people to be consuming? Well, there are real questions about whether Americans are vitamin and mineral deficient, and if they were, whether you'd like to see them delivered in a vehicle like this, sugar water. But So it's called vitamin water, so it has a health aura to begin with. Um, athletic celebrities like Kobe Bryant and LeBron James are marketing vitamin water. And then vitamin water has all these kinds of versions. So there's a revive version, a power version, energy version, focus, defense version. And so a consumer advocacy group sued Coca-Cola saying that vitamin water was um, not really such a healthy thing, but they were making it look like it was healthy, so it was deceptive and misleading advertising. A lawyer for Coca-Cola asked that the lawsuit get dismissed, and here's what he said when he approached the judge. No consumer could reasonably be misled into thinking vitamin water was a healthy beverage. So can you trust an industry that does this, that puts that product out there, it has health written all over it, in the marketing and even the, the name of the product, and then they say that no, no consumer would be misled into thinking it was a healthy beverage. Here's another example. You may have heard that the, the White House, the Food and Drug Administration, and an Institute of Medicine committee have been deliberating whether putting nutrition information on the front of a package in a set of symbols could help consumers make better choices. The IOM, the Institute of Medicine Committee, and as you know, the Institute of Medicine is a highly regarded objective body with leading scientists coming together to issue reports, was due to issue a report this fall in several months on front of package labeling systems. The industry, back in January, completely preempted the White House, the FDA, and the Institute of Medicine Committee by launching its own nutrition set of symbols on the packages that they call nutrition keys. And they promised to spend $50 million promoting this system. So if you go and look on the supermarket shelves, you'll, at cereals in particular, you'll start to see these nutrition keys show up in boxes. Now, it's impressive how small the symbols are. Um, we, did, we just did one estimate of one box of a sugared cereal, Cocoa Krispies as I recall, and found that the nutrition keys were 1% of the, the, the front of the box. So they're very small. But also, if you look at the existing nutrition literature on nutrition keys, it would suggest that this system is fundamentally flawed in a number of ways. Uh, first, it's got too many symbols for people to make sense of. Second, it's got these DV numbers on the bottom, 25% DV. How many of you know what DV stands for? Okay, so here you have a highly educated group of people, and only some of you know what, what it even matters. Well, think about the average person in the population. So how will people make sense of these? 
Plus, the system that's probably been tested the most is a system that got used in the UK with traffic lights, where they put red, green, and yellow symbols on products to, sh to make it easy for consumers to know what high, medium, and low is. Because how, do, how does a consumer look at this and make sense of whether it's high, medium, or low? Plus, the industry said that the four constituents on the left would remain constant, but the industry could choose two, um, two things to the right that they could use at their discretion. So those particular things, in this case potassium and fiber, can change depending on industry. So this is not, at least in my mind, considered a step of good faith by the food industry. And so uh, not too long ago in June, um, I wrote a piece with Jeffrey Copeland, who is the former head of the Centers for Disease Control, talking about the industry maneuver with this front of package labeling system and asked whether it was an abuse of the public trust. Because why couldn't the industry have waited till the Institute of Medicine released its report this fall and then used whatever the Institute of Medicine recommended? That would have been what was scientifically most justified. Well, one could guess that they didn't want to have to abide by a system that would adversely affect the sales of its products and lead people to eat a healthier diet. So they preemptively la launched that Nutrition Keys approach. Um, Jeff Copeland and I also wrote a piece in a journal called JAMA uh, on the response of the food and beverage industry to the obesity threat. And we, and we asked whether they're acting in good faith. And we looked at a number of things that they're doing and looked to see where they're spending their money. And it gets to be very interesting. You may have heard that this year, the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia got a $10 million gift from the American Beverage Association. Again, they're the trade association for the soft drink companies like Coke and Pepsi. Why do you think Philadelphia got a $10 million gift and it didn't go to the Children's Hospital of Baltimore or Washington or Wichita or Miami or Detroit? Any guess? Could it have anything to do with the fact that Philadelphia came within one vote of passing a two penny per ounce tax on sugar sweetened beverages. And in comes a gift to the Children's Hospital, creating conflicts of interest. And as many people have written about, what the industry buys with this money is silence. They buy silence. So I, I just wonder if you call the, the, the chairman of the, the president of the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and said, what's your stance on sugar sweetened beverages and taxes? you'd probably hear we don't have any official position. They've been silenced by a $10 million gift. This kind of thing has happened time and time and time again. So if you look at these companies and their, the conflicts of interest that they create, they're legendary. Community organizations all around the country are getting money from these companies. Anti-hunger groups are getting a lot of money from, from these companies. And they're the official, Coke is an official sponsor of the PTA, no less, the Parent Teacher Association. They're a corporate sponsor of the American Dietetic Association. Now, that's almost beyond belief. I mean, here's an organization that's the leading nutrition organization in the country. It makes public statements all the time about nutrition and nutrition policy issues. But Coca-Cola is a corporate sponsor of it. And so these conflicts of interest are something that get cultivated very carefully by the companies and something that create problems with public policy. So if you look at things that the tobacco industry did, paying scientists to do science that then turns out to be positive for the industry, paying professional organizations like the American Dietetic Association, distorting the science, all those sort of things, you see a long list of things that the tobacco industry did. What about the food industry? Well, at least in my mind, they're doing every one of these sort of things. It's remarkable how closely the food industry is following the tobacco industry playbook. But they respond viciously if you, if you mention this. And they'll, because the last thing they want to do is to look like the tobacco industry. Well, if they don't want to look like tobacco industry, it would be nice if they didn't behave like the tobacco industry. So I think that, um, Collab at this point, we can give the, the, food, the food industry the opportunity to prove itself worthy of the public trust. 
And they can make all the promises they want, but somebody has to find out whether they're actually holding true to their promises and whether these promises, e even if they're, they're kept, will help improve public health. But if the industry doesn't prove itself trustworthy, and we have some data just from what I presented about whether you can trust them, then I think industry needs to get involved more aggressively. So I'd like to end by talking about change agents and who might be in the best position to help address these obesity-related issues. When Tom Frieden was health commissioner of New York, he did several things uh, with the support of Mayor Bloomberg, who's a very public health-oriented mayor, related to diet. One of them was to get rid of trans fats in all New York City restaurants. Uh, this was a hard-fought victory. Um, the, the city got sued by the food industry. Then they put into place the first menu labeling regulations in the country where restaurants had to show the calories in their food items. Again, the industry fought back against this, but the city prevailed. What the city did, what the health commissioner did, and this, be, this was a major breakthrough in thinking in the United States, was to say that as a health commissioner, I have jurisdiction and authority over the long-term consequences of food, not just the short-term consequences. So if food is tainted and people get sick from it, then the city health authorities are all over that. But those are short-term, acute, generally not even serious problems. That's not always true, but it often is true. But if, if, if many, many, many people are dying from the long-term consequences of food, the city officials haven't, haven't expressed interest in that or authority over it, that's now changing. And so Frieden changed this and created better legal defaults. Now, if you went to New York City and you wanted to get people not to eat trans fats when they're at restaurants, think about how hard that would do through, how hard it would be to do that through education. Or you can just pass a law, get rid of them, cost nothing at all. So that would be an example of changing the legal defaults. So we think a lot about who the potential change agents are, and this, of course, will vary from place to place. But in the United States, some of the change agents might look like this. AGs, by the way, stand for the state attorneys general. And then you can think about what it takes to activate these agents, and then the public health community can get geared up to try to help these agents make positive changes and encourage them to do it. Here's an interesting example. Richard Blumenthal, who's now a U.S. Senator from Connecticut, several years ago was the Attorney General. Connecticut's the state where I live. The food industry in 2009 launched a program called Smart Choices. Now this is another bit of data about whether you can trust the food industry. What they did was they, the food industry got together essentially with itself, with some external scientific input, and created a list of nutrition criteria, and any product that met or exceeded those nutrition criteria could be given this Smart Choices label. And so the criteria were, were so weak that products like these could be considered a smart choice. So Connecticut's Attorney General decided that this might be misleading and deceptive. And so a series of things happened in a very short period of time in 2009 that led to an interesting outcome. There was an article in the New York Times that was critical of smart choices right as, as it was launched. The Connecticut Attorney General announced an investigation into smart choices, which is a serious legal matter in the United States, in October. The commissioner of the Food and Drug Administration was critical in a public phone call about the Smart Choices program, and the companies pulled it scarcely six weeks after it had been launched into the market. Why did they pull it? Because they got bad publicity for it, and because an attorney general launched an official investigation into them. So that shows us that the legal authorities in the U.S., even at the level of a single state, can have a national impact. <clears throat> Here's another example. Cocoa Krispies got released with that big health claim down there. Now help supports your child's immunity. Well, what did they do? They threw a few extra vitamins in it, and then they said it helps support immunity. Well, the city attorneys in San Francisco, just one city, went after them, and Kellogg's pulled this from the shelves. So people are watching. They're no longer letting the industry get by with these things. Now, I'd like to end with three video clips. I'm going to show you two video clips that pertain to the tobacco industry, and then I'm going to show you an interview with a CEO of Coca-Cola. And what I'd like you to do is think about how different these really are from one another. Because again, it speaks to this issue of whether you can trust the food companies. 
Now, many of you will know this is a famous picture. It's a photograph of the seven leading chairman of the boards or the presidents of the tobacco companies. And they were being questioned by members of Congress, in this case a, a congressman named Ron Wyden, who was specifically asking them, is nicotine addictive? Okay, and so here's what they said under oath. So this will be a video and you can hear the, hear it. Let me uh, begin my questioning on the matter of uh, whether or not nicotine is addictive. Let me ask you first, and I'd like to just go down the row, uh, whether each of you believe uh, that nicotine is not addictive. I heard virtually all of you touch on it, just yes or no. Do you believe nicotine is not addictive? I believe nicotine is not addictive, yes. Mr. Johnson. Uh, Congressman, Cigarettes and nicotine clearly do not meet the classic definitions of addiction. There is no right. intoxication. We'll, we'll take that as a no, and again, time is short. If you could just, I think each of you believe nicotine is not addictive. We just would like to have this for the record. I don't believe that nicotine or our products are addictive. I believe nicotine is not addictive. I believe that nicotine is not addictive. I believe that nicotine is not addictive. And I, too, believe that nicotine is not addictive. Now, you may remember that uh, what, what happened after this, um, this particular event occurred is the state attorneys general, a number of them in the United States, sued the tobacco companies. And during the discovery phase of the lawsuit, which in U.S. legal terms means that the parties have to turn over internal records, it was shown that those tobacco company executives knew that nicotine was addictive because their own scientists had shown it to be the case. And internal documents documented that they were lying, that they had perjured themselves in front of Congress by saying that nicotine wasn't addictive. <clears throat> so let's look next at another clip from the tobacco industry. Now these are television interviews with prominent tobacco company representatives. The first one is uh, Philip Morris CEO, I believe. Have they been proved to be safe, Mr. Coleman? I believe they have not been proved to be unsafe because when, as and if, any ingredient in cigarette smoke is identified as being injurious to human health, we are confident that we can eliminate that ingredient. And I concluded from that report it's true that the babies born from women who smoke are smaller, but they're just as healthy as the babies born from women who do not smoke. What about the higher and rate some women would prefer having smaller babies. Out. From our standpoint, um, if anyone ever identified any ingredient in tobacco or in smoke um, as being hazardous to human health or as being a, um, something that shouldn't be there, we could eliminate it. But no one ever has. But your own research department has identified those components. Dr. Wakeham has told me that he agrees that there are components in tobacco smoke which are, which are carcinogenic. In, in quantities that would, that are, would be considered important? I don't think that so. That depends on how many you smoke, but he agrees that there are elements in cigarettes, in the content of cigarettes, which are carcinogenic. Well, there certainly are in the air of New York City. None of the things which have been found in tobacco smoke are at concentrations which can be considered harmful. But the components themselves can be considered harmful, can they not? Anything can be considered harmful. Applesauce is harmful if you get too much of it. I don't think many people are dying from applesauce. They're not eating that much. People are smoking a lot of cigarettes. Well, let me say it this way. The people who eat applesauce die. The people who eat sugar die. Uh, the people who smoke cigarettes die. Does the fact that the people who smoke cigarettes die demonstrate that smoking is the cause? Now one thing that was interesting about that is um, 
how oh geez, how similar the scripting is, that those those Tobacco Institute executives were exactly on script, and, fi and because they said, well, if we find anything in our tobacco products that's harmful, we'll take it out. Of course. Well, this was 1971. This was seven years after the Surgeon General's reports talking about cigarettes causing lung cancer, and they're still saying if we find anything in tobacco that's hurting people then we'll take action on it. Okay, so let's get to the modern day food environment. And I'd like to show you this clip from the Coca-Cola CEO and from Fox News. Um, and I'm sorry, you're gonna have to watch a 15 second ad because I have to pull this from the internet before that. I don't even know what the ad is for, but you'll see that. And then you'll see this interview. Now he's being asked, this is by a Fox News interviewer no less, about damaging consequences of sugar sweetened beverage consumption. And look to see how he answers the question about whether there's a link between sugar beverage consumption and bad health. And then think back to what those tobacco industry representatives said. City in America, that is the focus of part two of my exclusive interview with Coca-Cola chairman and CEO, Ruth Hart. Take a look. You know people who are watching this, people like me, who are the mother of three children. Our kids see us drinking Coke or other sodas, and they want them too. Can, can you honestly sit here and say the sugar in these products isn't in part adding to the obesity in this country? There is absolutely no evidence to suggest that the sugar and, um, by the way, as I said, 25% of our entire portfolio is now sugar-free or low-calorie. But there is absolutely... Are those the drinks, though, that our kids have? But l let me just... Um, uh, no, well, ab absolutely. There's, we have vitamin... Just take our portfolio of vitamin water. We've just um, launched vitamin water with um, um, uh, natural non-caloric sweeteners that have 10 calories. Uh, there's, they're, they're wonderful products to have for, for every uh, age and every generation. So you believe that the New England Journal of Medicine, Medicine and the American Heart Association's report on obesity and, and adding to things like di diabetes or heart disease, you don't believe them? It's not a question I don't believe them. For every one report that comes out like that, there's also other reports that says that there's no empirical evidence. The question is, how do you consume responsibly and how do you induce a change in behavior so that we can start talking about a healthier country? Business has been doing a lot. As I said, we've reduced our calories by 25 percent in the last few haven't years. Haven't you reduced those calories by 25 percent in part because of the criticism that we can get a supersize Coke at a McDonald's or we were consuming two liter bottles of soda at record levels. I mean, I would assume that some of your packaging, some of the, the, the placement of the way you put things in a supermarket has changed and, and this is something you worry about. It's not about worry. It's about ensuring that we can be ahead of consumer trends. Consumers are dictating what we do. It's about portion control. It's about more uh, exercise. It's about change in behavior. It's about responsible marketing. Take schools, for example. Um, on a voluntary basis, we have been able to reduce the calories from soft drinks in schools by 58%. To go out and say, this product group is faulty, whereas others are not. Or to say, soft drinks are the cause when you know that a, 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 the calories from an 8-ounce Coca-Cola is, is 100, and it is, is less than many other juice products. You, that's the piece that we, we, we need to look at the facts. If you were asked to testify in front of Congress on this, will you testify on it? Absolutely. Okay, so... Um, Facebook. All right, try this, everybody. Uh, Unemployment at 8 point... So we can ask ourselves how similar those tobacco industry executives were to what the Coca-Cola person is saying today. Now, he said, for every study that shows a link between sugar beverage consumption and bad health outcomes, there's another study showing that that's not true. That is not true. If you put them on a scale, the ones that 
show a link between bad health outcomes and sugared beverage consumption would greatly outweigh the other ones. And why are there studies showing that there's no link? Well, some of it's objective science, but a lot of it's studies that they, these companies are paying for themselves. And then they cite those studies to show that their products are not having any impact. It's exactly what the tobacco industry did. So you can ask yourself, is the industry a trustworthy enough partner? But this is some information that we've collected about how the industry has behaved. And I think that interacting with industry around the policy table is a highly dangerous problem. And it's not just a philosophical problem, it's a problem of saving human lives. Country after country, let the tobacco industry argue that it did not need to be regulated. And you can count the number of unnecessary lives lost in the millions because government took way too long to react. Are we at that same place in the history with the food industry? Again, we all have to make our own judgments about that. But it's important to look at the tactics that the industry is using when we ask ourselves whether or not they've been trustworthy. Think back to those public health heroes that stood up to the tobacco industry. And look where it got us now. The United States, half the people are smoking than were before. One of the greatest public health victories of the last century. Because people were heroic enough to stand up to the industry and encourage legislators to have courage themselves so that they could make changes. So we have to ask ourselves where we are in history and how we can be courageous enough to move ahead. So thank you very much for coming today. It's been a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much. Uh, so hoping for questions. There are questions here in the room and also in the countries. Or comments. <laughs> Come on. Uh, thank you very much. It was a tremendously uh, interesting presentation. Uh, this is a tremendously interesting subject. And it just, for some reason, it's, it's, it's funny, but the older I get, the more interested I get in, 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 <laughs> in trying to be healthy. Because, you know, you get, you're, you're, you're getting, when you're a kid, you don't think about this stuff. And that, it goes to, to some of the danger here, how, not only how easily they are influenced, but how how easily they don't want, they don't even need to process if it's important or not. That's another dynamic that's, that's, uh, that's interesting in, in, in this whole thing. But, but uh, we that are getting older, uh, I'm probably the oldest one in the room here, but uh, uh, sorry, Dr. Dudwell, maybe, maybe there's an exception. But, <laughs> but you know, we, we are, uh, we are, you're a young girl. We, we're, you know, we're all very interested in this. And I guess, my, my question is, is, it's very simple, who do you trust? What sources of information, if you have a list of websites somewhere uh, that you know you can go to that are giving you the facts? Because news reports, studies, I, mean, I don't know from whom, I'll never forget the day, 20-some years ago, I stopped eating eggs. And I've been really upset ever since. <laughs> because I love eggs. And one day they told me they were horrible for me. I stopped eating them. And then some years later, apparently, they're not so bad anymore. You know, after 25 years of giving up my, my daily eggs. So, <laughs> it's... It, I'm 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 back on eggs now, <laughs> but the the you know the point is you get a lot of mixed information out there. Uh, I think your your presentation really spoke well to to how deception you know comes into play. But you know, us older adults, you know, where can we go to rely on? Is there a list of reliable source data that? that doesn't have this conflicting thing where their milk is good, where their milk is not good, whether, you know, we all know sodas are horrible and I have, I have gotten that out of my diet. But there are other food uh, supplements out there that are, that you get conflicting, you get conflicting stories. And not only nutrition, but on the amount of exercise and this and that and the other. So 
if there's a place to go or a recommended uh, sites that you know you can count on, that, it, it would be really appreciated. Sure, Thank thanks. You. Thanks for the question. Um, and it's, it's a very good one because consumers get very confused about what's right to eat and what's not because the information changes so quickly. Now, on one hand, you want the information to change quickly because you hope people are doing new studies and that we learn as we go ahead. And by definition, we're going to change our minds because we get new information. But it's still confusing for consumers. Um, I think the, the, the sources, I th the U.S. government, I think, has some very good websites on healthy eating and things like that. The USDA has some. They, they get better all the time. Over the years, they've been pretty heavily influenced by food industry interests. But I think that's getting to be less the case. So, and the government is very conservative with this stuff. So they'll tell you, to, they'll, they'll give you pretty good advice on what's healthy to eat, but they won't talk very much about what you should eat less of or what's unhealthy to eat, because that's where the food industry influence becomes important. One website that I really like, and others in the room who are nutrition experts might have more to say about this than, than I would, but um, the Harvard School of Public Health has a very good nutrition program, and they have an excellent website with, um, with information on, on how to eat healthy. And also Walter Willett, who's the, the chief of that section, has written a book that I think it's called Eat, Drink, and Be Healthy. That, that's quite a good book. So um, some of their, the positions they take are controversial, but I find them quite a trustworthy source. So my guess is if you just Google Harvard Nutrition, you'll come up with their website. Okay. Thank you very much. And, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. No, Ladies first. Sorry. Absolutely. <laughs> I, got, I got a list. I got a list. And tobacco industry. Yeah, that's the problem. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. And you have seen my smile. I'm the one in charge of tobacco control here. So really, it was like having a flashback of all the story that we need to try to convince people about the the danger of things about and the evilish nature of the tobacco industry. And, and really, what I really I'm afraid now is why, if we did so many work, you need to have the same difficult times in order to convince people. Because there is a very wrong assumption is that tobacco industry is the evil because they produce something that is legal. There's no way to use it good. And the other industries are good because they have good products. And this is totally wrong. And we, we see that the tobacco industry was a beautiful teacher for them. And they are applying exactly the same. Uh, I read something about the Coca-Cola in the in the newspaper that it was a one page in a, in a Sunday, and I was thinking this is a tobacco industry exactly the same. And now, the, before they were together, you you may remember that Altria was Philip Morris and Kraft Food, and Kraft Food was working to blackmail people not to uh, not to ban tobacco advertising because if they are not going to give them the Kraft Food advertisement, now. Four years ago, they split, and Kraft is miraculously not more part of Altria because now they know that they need to fight their own their own battles. But I I need to say that we need to work together. You you, I cannot think that public health is going to do the same work again, and you will never have our advantage at this having the internal documents of the industry because I know I think that today no one has an internal document that can be found. But still, the, the strategies are the same. We have a lot of proven. You have been working with the same guys we are. Chalupka for the economic thing. It's the same thing with, with us. So I hope that we don't need to do exactly the same and, and wait until millions of people is dying right. before we realize that. I agree. Um, one of the things that has been helpful is that there are some people in the obesity and nutrition field who believe that the lessons learned in tobacco are really important. And so I, I talk to the tobacco, you know, the tobacco people all the time about what did you learn, what are the corporate strategies, how did, you, how did you overcome this problem and things like that. And I've learned an awful lot from them and written papers with the tobacco people. So I think that history is extremely valuable, so I definitely agree with you. Now one of the things that I think that because of the tobacco industry, other companies, other industries like food aren't given the benefit of the doubt so much anymore. And so I, it seems to me that the progress that took decades um, in the tobacco field are, are compressed into a sh much shorter period of time with food. Um, and so things are happening fast, thanks in part to the heroic people in the tobacco field that stood up to those companies and showed how evil they were. I know that you have a list of yes. Do we have a question from the country? Yes. Uh, as a follow-up to uh, the original question, um, what is your advice for the public health community in collaborating with the 
sugar sweetened beverage industry to promote health and wellness? Should they say no like alcohol and tobacco companies? Well, it's a good question. The, the thing about that makes the food industry different from tobacco is that these, these companies, most of them do have better products to sell, which is nice. So that, that means they can shift their marketing from the unhealthy to the healthier products. Now, and the companies will say that we don't care which of our products people buy, we just want to sell products. So like Coca-Cola may, may give you the impression that they're just as happy to sell water as they are to sell Coca-Cola. I'm skeptical of that statement because people don't overconsume water. They do overconsume sugared beverages. And if we did a study with kids eating breakfast cereal, and if you give kids a low sugar cereal, they'll eat just about what a kid should eat for breakfast. You give them a high sugared cereal, they'll eat twice as much as they should have for breakfast. So the companies, I think, are going to have a very hard time figuring out a way to make as much money by selling healthier products. That would be lower in things like sugar, fat, and salt because they make those, those constituents make the food so highly palatable. So I don't think the industry will do this voluntarily. I think they'll stall. I think they'll create diversions. I think they'll distort the science to confuse the public. I think they'll make these self-regulatory promises to buy time. And in the meantime, they've locked in the status quo and their ability to sell their unhealthy products. So I think, uh, and I've, this isn't my, my thought originally, I've heard it from many people, but that self-regulation only has a chance of succeeding when there is heavy threat of government regulation. And I don't think that that exists now. So government getting involved could very well make self-regulation more effective. Thank you very much for a fascinating presentation. Really enjoyed it. Um, I have two questions in one. <laughs> the first is that um, when it comes to, to fat taxes, they, they say it works, but as a combined set of measures. And so I was wondering about the sugar tax. Uh, the states that were considering implementing it, were they considering doing so um, in conjunction with other strategies? In other words, uh, making sure that they weren't just um, increasing the taxes and therefore penalizing, let's say, um, ethnic minorities or, or lower socioeconomic, uh, groups of lower socioeconomic status um, in these so-called food deserts. And the second part is that um, y your stance on the behavior change communication and the individual um, intervention um, s seem to be quite quite strong, and I was wondering um, how does that actually work with the broader set of um, environmental factors? Because um, I, just referring to, um, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming you might have seen this or heard about it, the Jamie Oliver uh -huh. uh, television show, sure. and um, I watched one episode and I found it quite astonishing that families did not know how to cook vegetables, did not know how to do that. And so if children are, are being fed by their parents, then certainly there has to be behavior change communication components. So I was just wondering how you reconcile those two. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Very good questions, both of them. Uh, I'll answer the second question first. I'm, I'm all for education. I think it's a great idea. But the problem is who's going to pay for it? I mean, who's, who's out there with that checkbook ready to buy up enough education to compete with what the industry does? So that's why the, you know, the, the education just, I, I think, helps, but you just can't pay for enough of it to really make much of a difference, whereas these other things, these policies, can be done with no money at all. Um, the other uh, question you asked uh, about whether these to the taxes were are considered in the context of other things? The answer is unquestionably yes. Um, my own belief is that no single thing you could do, and you could you could make come up with your own favorite strategy to deal with obesity. If that's all you did, my guess is that no matter what it was, you wouldn't even get a blip in the obesity numbers. That you have to do a lot of stuff all together. And one of the greatest risks to public policy is to set up. Let's say you change nutrition in schools, you're successful of that. You set yourself up by failure, for failure by looking at body weight numbers after you implement an intervention like that because so much is happening to people that you just can't get an effect. So, for example, the sugar-sweetened beverage taxes and the places that have considered them, it's usually in conjunction with a lot of other nutrition-related policies they're trying to put into effect. Now, your question about um, the regressive nature of a tax is also a good one. Um, 
and I, and I should have mentioned this when I was speaking, most of the thoughtful proposals to, to do taxes have planned to use the revenues in a way that would specifically help the poor, like to subsidize fruits and vegetables, for example, or health care for the uninsured. You do things like that that would help provide benefit back to the communities that might be most hurt by a tax. Another question there? Another question. What standards should be used to have a successful self-regulation of the food and sugar sweetened beverage industry? Where is that from? Uh, okay. Um, the, one of the papers that I mentioned, whoever it was that asked that question, if you send me an email, I'll be happy to send you the paper that I alluded to in my talk on industry self-regulation because we addressed that exact question about what criteria should we apply to the industry to know whether its self-regulatory promises have been effective. But it's things like transparency in the process of coming up with a particular promise. Um, like the smart choices thing, you came up with ridiculous nutrition standards, so that was not a good process. Um, you have to have objective evaluation, not done by the industry itself, but by some outside party, of whether the industry is holding true to its promises. And then you have to calculate the public health benefit. Is it actually leading to positive changes? And if those sort of criteria can be met, then perhaps industry self-regulation we can look at it objectively and, I mean, you don't have to have a knee-jerk response against the industry or in favor of it. You say, okay, let's try it. Let's see if it works. Let's have some objective way of evaluating it. And if they failed, government has to be involved. If they've succeeded, great, we'll promote more of it. And so that paper that I discussed um, has some of those criteria. Hi, thank you. Um, in your presentation, you talked about how difficult it is sometimes for public health to compete with the industry um, for reasons such as they, it, the industry has more resources, has more money, has more lobbying power and more influence. Um, in your opinion, who do you think is responsible for leveling the playing field? And also, what are some of the strategies that we can use to level the playing field between um, public health and the food industry? Well. The, the government has to be the ultimate, bear the ultimate responsibility for weighing the, the um, corporate, corporate profits over the public good. And you hope that government acts in a responsible way to find a balance there. And you, you never want it to be totally against corporate, corporate interest, and you never want it to be totally in favor, but to come to some balance. And governments around the world differ a lot in that. The American government is notoriously pro-business and has been very slow to act on issues like tobacco and issues like food and nutrition. And that's why a lot of the, the progressive things happen outside the U.S. And you hope that we, we learn from those examples and follow them. Um, you know, there are bans on marketing of things to children in some countries around the world. The U.S. is nowhere near doing that. Um, the taxes, and then, then you, you hope to support things and the parts of America that, that do things first, and those tend to be the coasts, um, and then you hope you get good, good things occurring. But one of, the, one of the most important players, I think, in this, this whole thing, well, there, there are many important players, but I think the press is a really important player. And the, the, the corporate interests have trouble competing with public health in the domain of the press, at least some of the press because the press is skeptical of corporate interest and they love to hear public health things. So that's where you can really get the word out and have a big influence. So the press can be a very valuable ally. And I think other groups are untapped like parents. I think if parents can get outraged at the predatory behavior of these companies, then they can form a very powerful political force. Oh, and one thing I, I forgot to mention, when the first question came up, one of the first questions about education, if you, you want to do education, the question is what do you want to educate people to do? So we normally think you try to educate people so they will change their own behavior and they'll lead a better diet, let's say. But you can also educate people to become a political force. I mean, to speak up, to counter the companies, to vote in certain ways and things like that. So I think that's a, a part of education that hasn't really been explored carefully enough. Thank you, and again, uh, excellent presentation. Uh, I was listening to you as a public health professional and I was wondering if we could get a clip or, or a tape of the whole presentation and being able to share it with the public health community. But uh, 
At the same time, I was wondering the different publics and the different reactions to the content, to the idea and the way that was presented here. Uh, while it's so uh, consistent and so well documented uh, for the public health community, I wonder how other important publics would react, in particular consumers. I uh, really think that we need to uh, think more about the, the education component. And uh, I'm a uh, behavior change and education uh, specialist. I've been trained to think that way. And uh, besides any consideration about money or cost, uh, I think that uh, the idea of educated consumers providing choices and having them the final decision, not someone else thinking for them, I think this is something that is, is a value and it's a principle that uh, we have to be careful, you know, in presenting is either one. But uh, they're complementary and mm -hmm. it has to be there. It's a must, it's a right. And uh, um, I think that uh, um, the way that uh, we've been discussing, you know, uh, the role of consumers and individuals, they have a role to play, you know, and I think that that argument in terms of, uh, you know, not just thinking in, in one bullet, but uh, and the importance of the policy, mm -hmm. I think that that's a, a strong argument, you know, but I wouldn't remove totally because I think that that would be dangerous or, or something that uh, won't be accepted in general by the um, many of the communities. Mm -hmm. And then the, uh, for the uh, decision makers, the politicians, uh, that they are struggling, pull from many different fronts as you well uh, presented here, uh, facing an industry that is presenting themselves as, uh, uh, they're looking for, uh, survival in the future. This is a question of sustainability for them. Uh, the way that they phrase uh, their approach is they know that uh, if they kill the consumers through obesity, diabetes, they will lose their business. It's like a bad virus. It's like the Ebola virus. It's the worst virus because it's so violent that uh, kill the hosts and cannot survive. And uh, their approach is they want to work with the rest of the partners and the public health community because they want to, they have to change their products. They need to survive and they would like to, to do better. Uh, so the answer, no, you know, there is no dialogue, there is no possible. We understand that the history and tobacco has told us very many good lessons, you know, but for the, pub, the, the, the decision makers, the politicians there, I find very difficult for them to know in the countries or at the local level, uh, find ways to cooperate, like presenting them like they are enemies that there is no way to um, uh, open the dialogue, that this is the end of the, of the game for them. How would you address strategically, you know, that kind of dialogue from our side, you know, public health professionals, but uh, to deal with these challenges at the time where we are now, Hopefully, there will be a one point where the tobacco is in today. Okay. Well, thank you. There were a lot of good points in, in all that you had to say. Again, I'm not opposed to doing the education. I, I think it needs to be done, but I think it's, it's a slow process, and there's just, as I said, not enough money to do enough of it to really have a very strong impact, where you can get pretty rapid and powerful impact through changing the laws. So presumably you'd want to do all these things together. That would be the best. And I totally agree with you that if consumers are educated, then they will put pressure on politicians to make the right decisions. And that'll be a very helpful force. Plus consumers can just make different choices and they'd be better off for that. So I'm all for doing that. But it'd be great to find a, a funding source or a, a great to find a way to do it effectively that will counteract what the industry is doing. And I'm not, I'm not aware of ways to do that. Um, the idea about interacting with the industry, uh, you know, it's a controversial thing. In, in my field, people are all over the map and whether they trust the industry, whether they think you should talk to industry or not. We talk to the industry a lot, but we, we do it under a certain set of circumstances. We don't take any money from industry, which makes us unusual in my field. The nutrition field, a lot of people are taking money from industry, a lot of the leaders in the field. 
and we, we hope to have dialogue with industry in a way that we in a, in a way we call safe space so we have discussions with industry where we can be open and they can be open but um, but we kind of do it in a safe way and I think that's a helpful thing but not taking the money is a big thing so I we you know I get asked to go talk to the you know corp the, the uh, board of directors of some of these associations and some of the companies and I'll do it but I'll pay my own way rather than getting paid to do it because I think that helps remove the conflicts of interest I just don't think the industry has proven itself trustworthy as you could hear from my comments and um, every day we wait the problem gets worse and more people die and things like that so um, the, I think the industry needs to prove itself trustworthy in a real hurry before we can yield to them and say that self-regulation works. So my, my default is to say that self-regulation doesn't work until they prove that it does, rather than the reverse, which is the way our country does it, which is say, let, let's let them self-regulate, and if we prove it doesn't work, then we get involved. So it's just a different kind of an approach. Yeah, just a, a brief comment and a question. Um, I think another example that is useful, you know, when talking about the whole um, issue of of unhealthy foods is the history of the International Code of Marketing of Breast Milk Substitutes oh, yeah. and how the issue of breastfeeding has been supported through policies, legislation, not absolutely successful. I mean, there's good experiences and not so good experiences. But the bottom line is that you know, in Latin America, we've seen breastfeeding rates really improve. And so um, again, it's a host of different policies and strategies and communications campaigns that have coalesced to bring these changes about. And we see much bigger changes in countries that have really aggressively pursued this, such as Brazil, than we do in other countries that have not. So it's just another, in, in some ways it's I think a really apropos um, comparison because you can argue there's no social redeeming value to cigarettes. However, we all eat. And there is a need for infant formula in certain situations. Sure. Um, but my question really is about agricultural policy. Because I'm actually concerned about the point that brought up about um, you know, taxes can be very discriminatory, particularly among poor segments of the population. It costs, it costs a lot more to eat well. It just does. Right. And I'm not convinced that you know, tax eat and putting some of that money back into fruit and vegetables is really going to address you know, the problem of how we make affordable, healthy foods to sectors of society that can, cannot afford them. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank, thanks for the excellent points. I think the, the breast, breast milk <coughs> versus infant formula is a terrifically interesting example. And there, I think there's a lot to be learned from that. And how the, how the corporations responded, how governments countered, who stood up to them, who was courageous enough to do that, and it has led to some very impressive gains. Not my area of expertise, but looking in from the outside, my impression is the same as yours that have been some very strong advances there. So I think that's a great example. Um, the, um, the regressive tax idea is an, is an interesting one. The same argument was made with tobacco, of course, because the poor people were smoking more. And it turned out, um, from what my economist friends tell me, that the the poor experienced the greatest benefit from the taxes because they were least likely to be insured and so the fact that their disease rates went down benefited them most um, and that's without even any earmarking of the revenue to specifically help them and so w obesity is a regressive disease um, lung cancer was a regressive disease and so the question is do you want to use the taxes if it's affecting certain parts of the population most isn't that desirable in a way you can argue both sides of that, no question about it. But my feeling is that a tax is a highly controversial thing. You're most likely to sell it if you have something specifically done with the revenue to help the people that are most affected by it. But whether you can completely offset the regressivity or not, I don't know. And you know, it's not like you're taxing bread or some staple or gasoline that people have to use. You don't have to drink soda. I mean, there are diet versions, there's juice, there, well, you know, there's, there's other things, but and the companies sell those too. So it's a good point, and it's probably the most vexing, vexing part of the selling of the concept of the sugar beverage taxes. I have one question from the country. We have one question in Spanish. Okay. O un producto básico. Uno ¿Qué no opinión le merece una, una alianza? Una gaseosa o un refresco? 
es un punto muy importante y probablemente es el factor más difícil de esta idea de imponer un impuesto a las gaseosas. Tenemos una pregunta en español o un producto básico. ¿Qué, no opinión le merece una... de... ¿Qué opinión le merece una alianza partnership de la comunidad de salud pública o de las agencias internacionales de salud pública con la industria de alimentos para luchar contra las enfermedades crónicas? ¿Qué opinión le merece una alianza, partnership de la comunidad de salud pública o de las agencias internacionales de salud pública con la industria de alimentos para luchar contra las enfermedades crónicas? Boy, I think the food industry would love nothing better than to do exactly that. Um, the industry, every time it can find a place at the table, it wants to be there, and it wants to be part of these public policy discussions. Um, and I don't think the results of that are likely to be good, because uh, until the industry po proves it can behave in a better way, then I don't think having it at the public policy table makes any sense at all, because they make the arguments that all these other industries have made. You can trust us, we'll police ourselves. Uh, government doesn't need to get involved in this. It interrupts personal freedoms. There are all these common arguments that have been made across all kinds of industries. And I think this is, we face a crisis, and I think the, having the industry involved in these decisions will slow things down tremendously. The only conditions under which I think that's probably not true as I said before, is if the industry really is fearful of government regulation. So then they will have to self-regulate in a more effective way. And in some places, I think we're getting to that point. And there might be places around the world where having industry at the table will make sense because they are fe very fearful of government intervention. But I think that's less true in the United States. Two last questions, and then need to close because we have the translators. Uh, need to close so you can we can do both and then he will answer both and then we end. Hi, I just wanted to thank you for the talk. I found it very interesting um, and have personally struggled with working with uh, education in schools on nutrition and um, the lack of funding obviously is a big factor. But I was wondering if you could comment on the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act that was passed in 2010. And then I also, just if you have time, but if not, that's all right, um, about the new campaigns that they've launched for things such as clementines and peanuts that they're marketing to children. Um, clementines is cuties. I don't know if you've seen the ads for and um, peanuts and other nuts for energy rather than um, other alternatives. Thank you. Those, those, are, those are good questions. I'm, I'm seeing a lot of very positive developments in the United States, and some of them are because of these federal policies. So the, the act that you're talking about affects school nutrition, and I think is a very positive development because the nutrition standards in schools have been really tightened up because of federal government intervention here. Um, menu labeling is part of the health care reform legislation, so soon restaurants all around the country, the chain restaurants at least, will have to post calories. Um, and then you see fundamental things like in the WIC program with healthier food packages for the Women, Infants, and Children program. All these things I think are very positive signs that government really sees that it has a role in here. And then the other area, and this gets back to the, the agriculture policies and things, is you see more and more talk about how the farm bill can be structured in a way to help improve nutrition. And there was never talk about that going back even a few years, and now there's a lot of talk about it. And it's hard to know where it'll go, but at least there's talk. So I think as government policies across all sectors of the government can start to line up with health policy, like if transportation policy gets lined up with health policy, if, if uh, education policy lines up, if those things, agriculture policy, then we'll be a lot better off. And thankfully, people are really open about discussing these now. Thank you for your presentation. I wanted to follow up on the gentleman's comment on consumer reactions, because uh, I worked and I uh, helped organize one of the Capital Area Food Bank's Operation Frontlines to the Mary Center for Maternal and Child Care, through which we taught teenagers how to cook a healthy meal, healthy in terms of calories, sodium, cholesterol, 
for under $10. And the complaints I always heard from the teens themselves were that healthy food isn't tasty enough or healthy food doesn't, isn't filling enough, excuse me. And then the complaints we heard from the parents, many of whom were single moms, were that they're working all day, they don't have time to cook an extravagant meal, they live in food deserts, they don't have time to take a car or a metro, go to Safeway, a giant, a Whole Foods, get food, which is more expensive than, let's say, McDonald's or a microwavable pizza, because unfortunately, organic or healthy or conventional is a lot more expensive than what's, you know, deemed junk food. So I wanted to know what your response would be to these teens and their parents about the hardships of getting healthy food. Yeah, those, those are such hard questions because there's so many things that conspire to make life difficult in, in people in those circumstances um, that it, it's hard to think about how to even start and to overcome things. You know, one, one interesting problem is that food banks face is, is whether just to get calories into people and get as much food out there as you can independent of its nutrition. Some food banks believe that's the case and they get lots of donations to sugar beverages, for example. Others say, no, we're not going to feed people things that will make them unhealthy. And we have a policy against accepting those kind of things. So these are tricky, tricky issues. And, and I, you know, I don't know where we'll come down as a nation on those. But at least there's debate about them, which is really a nice thing. Um, you know, the one thing that you, you mentioned, the, the fact that these healthy foods that were getting prepared were considered boring by the people. You know, if, those, if you go back into human history and you, you gave those, those very foods that our folks consider boring to people, they would have thought it was an explosion of taste. But it's the fact that food gets manipulated now in so many ways with so many chemicals in them, the, the salt, the sugar, the flavors, the smell, the texture, every single property of food has been so heavily manipulated by the industry that we're accustomed to so much sensation from food that normal healthy things don't taste good any longer. And that's really got to be reversed. Now, how you go about reversing that, I don't know. But, you know, the, the, what, what, what effect do these things have on the brain? Uh, some of my talks, I start off by showing an ingredient list from a common food, and I have the audience try to guess what it is, and people guess a hundred different things. Well, it happens to be a chocolate Pop-Tart. But the, the thing that's interesting, there, there were 56 entries in that ingredient list, 56 different things put in that food. Well, what in the world is that doing to us? And, you know, what, is it, what does it make us get used to? And so, so I think if people could get used to just regular old food and not have to have this blizzard of sensation from all these ways food gets manipulated, we'd be a lot better off. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, it, was a, it was a great pleasure, and uh, we learned a lot, I'm sure, about that. And uh, this is so, such a good talk and uh, has been recorded. We'll be on the, on the web for many people who can enjoy this talk and the questions, also very rich questions. I thank very much everybody here for the questions. And fortunately, we need to close. Uh, we have uh, went to... Um, Thank our translator, our people in video who is doing that, the people back here is connecting the countries. And uh, Jenny, what is the next step? So. Uh, the next step is downstairs in the lobby. We have uh, food. And of course, it's going to be nice and healthy. Food. Yeah. <laughs> so for those who's not here in Washington, so we have a health food here for those here. So thank you very much.